The Free Library of Philadelphia is proud to present a podcast from our author event series, recorded live at the Central Library on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. To learn more about the Free Library, the Central Library Expansion Project, and how your contribution can help our programs and services for the community, please visit freelibrary.org. To you to yet another in our author series, which are ably brought to you by Andy Kahan back there. He does several hundred of these a year. So this is quite amazing. Okay. I'm Ann Humphreys. I'm the administrator for the 13 branches in the northwest area of the city. And as the Aldous Dyke in the Free Library, it's my pleasure. <laughs> it's my pleasure to toot Allison's horn. Um, I want you to look around at the auditorium. It's got like three inches of paint on it. And I want you to then close your eyes and think of a place that's actually modern and up to date and has seats from this millennium. And that will be our new auditorium during our central expansion and renovation project that we're looking forward to. Okay. This is the third event for Allison today. So she's come from looking for her on a shelf in Giovanni's room to having nationally known book reviewers take a look at, at Fun, Fun Home. So New York Times, uh, one of the Seattle papers, um, our very own PGN, The Inquirer, oh dear, and a bunch of others. I've got to hold this. Oh, Entertainment Weekly, you know? And she doesn't even appear to be wearing a thong. And yet, <laughs> Entertainment Weekly was interested in her. So, Allison's already extraordinarily well known amongst the lesbian nation for dykes to watch out for. That's an accurate description of us and our friends and mostly our issues. It's, I've talked to a number of people who think that she must be eavesdropping because they just said that at potluck last week. So, Fun Home is also an amazing mating of drawings and words, but very different. It's, it's so much more specific. So much, and when I say specific, she even goes to the point of documenting things. You'll see copies of notes and drawings and journal entries and things, actual objects and all. It's very interesting. And it's also not a direct reflection like Dykes to watch out for, as much as an Alice through the looking glass sort of reflection of how her life is an adverse reflection of her father's. And unlike Dykes, where the book titles change and people's t-shirts change from, from frame to frame and billboards change from frame to frame, this remains steady throughout. So that took a little bit of getting used to because I kept hoping she'd slip and put a trick in, but I didn't see any. It's, but you can see where they intersect. From the first pages where she's playing Icarus, flying on her father's feet, you see little baby Mo in the striped shirt. <laughs> And then you see Moe's encounter with her first, Alice and Moe, excuse me, Alice and slash Moe's encounter with her first dyke that she knew in a diner on page 117 for those of you who are taking notes, okay? This is so much better than that garbage anime. You know, I mean, this is real drawing, individual things. It doesn't look like cookie cutter. You couldn't make it on your computer with a cheap bootlegged program. It's the real deal. And it's, not only is it better than anime, it's better, far better than most print autobiographies. And I think this is like the first really, really successful crossover graphics piece that we're going to see. Um, because it's her life, which though traumatic, is a lot less traumatic than Mouse, M-A-U-S, remember that? Mouse 1 and 2, the Holocaust book. I mean, this is just personal stuff that isn't a whole... It, that, that, though, gripping and good turned off a lot of people. I don't think that you'll, you're going to have that trouble. I didn't see mouse anywhere in here. So, so I, I want you to see this, and I want you to see how different it is being out and not being out, and the terrible consequences of this. If this thing needed a subti subtitle, it would be the old silence equals death when you come to read about her father. Thank you. Come on up. Hi, thank you, Anne, for that 
Wonderful introduction. Hi, it's so cool to be here in the free library. What a beautiful building. Um, thank you all for coming. Hey, do we need to turn the lights down? We didn't talk about that. Let's see. Can you all see that? Okay. All right, then we'll leave them. Oh, good. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you from my book. Chapter 1, Old Father, Old Artificer. Like many fathers, mine could occasionally be prevailed on for a spot of airplane. As he launched me, my full weight would fall on the pivot point between his feet and my stomach. It was a discomfort well worth the rare physical contact and certainly worth the moment of perfect balance when I soared above him. In the circus, acrobatics where one person lies on the floor balancing another are called Icarian games. Considering the fate of Icarus after he flouted his father's advice and flew so close to the sun that his wings melted, perhaps some dark humor is intended. In our particular reenactment of this mythic relationship, it was not me but my father who was to plummet from the sky. But before he did so, he managed to get quite a lot done. His greatest achievement, arguably, was his monomaniacal restoration of our old house. When other children called our house a mansion, I would demur. I resented the implication that my family was rich or unusual in any way. In fact, we were unusual, though I wouldn't appreciate exactly how unusual until much later, but we were not rich. The gilt cornices, the marble fireplace, the crystal chandeliers, the shelves of calf-bound books, these were not so much bought as produced from thin air by my father's remarkable ledger domain. My father could spin garbage into gold. He could transfigure a room with the smallest offhand flourish. He could conjure an entire finished period interior from a paint chip. <laughs> he was an alchemist of appearance, a savant of surface, a Daedalus of decor. For if my father was Icarus, he was also Daedalus that skillful artificer, that mad scientist who built the wings for his son and designed the famous labyrinth. <laughs> and who answered not to the laws of society, but to those of his craft. Historical restoration wasn't my father's job. It was his passion. And I mean passion in every sense of the word. Libidinal, manic, martyred. Our Gothic Revival house had been built during the small Pennsylvania towns, one brief moment of wealth from the lumber industry in 1867. But local fortunes had declined steadily from that point and by the time my parents bought the place in 1962, it was a shell of its former self. The shutters and scroll work were gone. The clabbards had been sheathed with scabrous shingles. The bare light bulbs revealed dingy wartime wallpaper and woodwork painted pastel green. All that was left of the house's lumber era glory were the exuberant front porch supports. But over the next 18 years, my father would restore the house to its original condition and then some. He 
He would perform, as Daedalus did, dazzling displays of artfulness. He would cultivate the barren yard into a lush, flowering landscape. He would manipulate flagstones that weighed half a ton and the thinnest quivering layers of gold leaf. It could have been a romantic story, like in It's a Wonderful Life, when Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed fix up that big old house and raise their family there. But in the movie, when Jimmy Stewart comes home one night and starts yelling at everyone, it's out of the ordinary. Daedalus, too, was indifferent to the human cost of his projects. He blithely betrayed the king, for example, when the queen asked him to build her a cow disguise so she could seduce the white bull. Indeed, the result of that scheme, a half-bull, half-man monster, inspired Daedalus' greatest creation yet. He hid the minotaur in the labyrinth, a maze of passages and rooms opening endlessly into one another, and from which, as stray youths and maidens discovered to their peril, escape was impossible. Then there are those famous wings. Was Daedalus really stricken with grief when Icarus fell into the sea? or just disappointed by the design failure. Sometimes when things were going well, I think my father actually enjoyed having a family, or at least the air of authenticity we lent to his exhibit, a sort of still life with children. <laughs> and of course my brothers and I were free labor. Dad considered us extensions of his own body, like precision robot arms. In this regard, it was like being raised not by Jimmy, but by Martha Stewart. <laughs> In theory, his arrangement with my mother was more cooperative. In practice, it was not. We each resisted in our own ways. <laughs> but in the end, we were equally powerless before my father's curatorial onslaught. My brothers and I couldn't compete with the astral lamps and girandoles and heppelwhite sweet chairs. They were perfect. I grew to resent the way my father treated his furniture like children and his children like furniture. My own decided preference for the unadorned and purely functional emerged early. I was Spartan to my father's Athenian. Modern to his Victorian. Butch to his Nelly. Utilitarian to his esthete. I developed a contempt for useless ornament. <laughs> what function was served by the scrolls, tassels, and bric-a-brac that infested our house? If anything, they obscured function. They were embellishments in the worst sense. They were lies.
My father began to seem morally suspect to me long before I knew that he actually had a dark secret. He used his skillful artifice not to make things, but to make things appear to be what they were not. That is to say, impeccable. He appeared to be an ideal husband and father, for example, but would an ideal husband and father have sex with teenage boys? It's tempting to suggest in retrospect that our family was a sham, that our house was not a real home at all, but the simulacrum of one, a museum. Yet we really were a family, and we really did live in those period rooms. Still, something vital was missing. An elasticity, a margin for error. Most people, I imagine, learn to accept that they're not perfect. but an idle remark about my father's tie over breakfast could send him into a tailspin. My mother established a rule. If we couldn't criticize my father, showing affection for him was an even dicier venture. We were not a physically expressive family, to say the least, but once I was unaccountably moved to kiss my father goodnight. Having little practice with the gesture, all I managed was to grab his hand and bust the knuckles lightly, as if he were a bishop or an elegant lady, before rushing from the room in embarrassment. This embarrassment on my part was a tiny scale model of my father's more fully developed self-loathing. His shame inhabited our house <clears throat> as pervasively and invisibly as the aromatic musk of aging mahogany. <coughs> In fact, the meticulous period, <clears throat> excuse me, the meticulous period interiors were expressly designed to conceal it. Mirrors, distracting bronzes, multiple doorways, visitors often got lost upstairs. My mother, my brothers and I knew our way around well enough but it was impossible to tell if the minotaur lay beyond the next corner. And the constant tension was heightened by the fact that some encounters could be quite pleasant. His bursts of kindness were as incandescent as his tantrums were dark. Although I'm good at enumerating my father's flaws, it's hard for me to sustain much anger at him. I expect this is partly because he's dead and partly because the bar is lower for fathers than for mothers. My mother must have bathed me hundreds of times, for example. But it's my father rinsing me off with the purple metal cup that I remember most clearly. The suffusion of warmth as the hot water sluiced over me the sudden unbearable cold of its absence. Was he a good father? I want to say at least he stuck around, but of course he didn't. It's true that he didn't kill himself until I was nearly 20. 
but his absence resonated retroactively, echoing back through all the time I knew him. Maybe it was the converse of the way amputees feel pain in a missing limb. He really was there all those years, a flesh and blood presence, steaming off the wallpaper, digging up the dogwoods, polishing the finials, smelling of sawdust and sweat and designer cologne. But I ached as if he were already gone. That's the end of the first chapter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's always really intense to read that. But now um, I'm going to go into this sort of geeky thing and show you like how I do my drawings. Sort of abrupt after that, but that's what we're going to do. <laughs> and, then, and then I'll read a little bit more for you at the end. But I think it's interesting, you know, the, the thing about a graphic novel is that it's not just a story, it's really a physical object. And talking about the physical object is sort of part of talking about the book. So I'm going to show you how I made it. Um, it took me a really long time to do this. It took seven years. Because you not only have to write it, but then you have to <laughs> draw it <laughs> like a monk illuminating a manuscript. Um, I'm going to show you the evolution of like one panel. I would work on a whole page at a time, but this is just one panel. Um, and I would write it on my computer in a drawing program where I could move around these... Um, I could like create boxes for the text and reshape them. And this is a digital font of my lettering, so I could also edit that very quickly and easily without having to like write it all out by hand. And as I went along, I would just write a description here, like we were on the roof of a building watching fireworks. I'd write what the picture was going to be rather than drawing it. And once I had the writing done to my satisfaction, I would print that out, and I'd start sketching right on my typing paper. And then I'd put tracing paper over that and refine it a little bit. And then I'd do that again. <laughs> this part is really hard for me. Um, I feel like I'm not really naturally a very good drawer. I just work very hard at it. Um, and this, this initial stage when everything just looks terrible, you know, it's not the way I want it to be in the end. Uh, it's just very frustrating and laborious. And um, I'll show you part of, part of how I get everything more refined and more detailed is by doing a, all of this visual research that I'll show you. This scene happens on a rooftop in Greenwich Village in New York in 1976. And part of what happens in the scene is that I um, notice this bunch of gay men standing around together. And like I identify them as gay men for the first time. So one thing I had to do was research what were gay men wearing <laughs> and what, what, what was their hair like in 1976, because I knew I didn't want to get that wrong. Um, <laughs> So, I, you know, this was like two days. I was looking at documentaries and old books. This is something I got online from a stock photo place, this disco guy. Um, I did tons of research on that. I somehow, I, I could not have done this book without Google image search, let me just say that. Um, I actually put in the address of this building where we were, 350 Bleecker Street, and I got the very rooftop that we were on because the building turned into a co-op and now they have their own website. Um, and in 1976, there was no furniture on the roof. There were no plants. And my scene is looking downtown, not uptown like this. But somehow just finding this actual place was very helpful to me. I'm very much um, a method cartoonist. It's hard for me to make things up. <laughs> and then I would steal images from other places. This is one of Del LaGrace Volcano's um, photographs in the Drag King book. And I remember there were images in there like photos from rooftops. And so I used those buildings in the background in my drawing. And then I went back to Google and put in fireworks. And I looked at dozens of pictures of fireworks. It seems like that would be pretty easy to do, you know, but I don't know. I have to, I have to see it. More stock photos um, of those water towers. 
And then it would put, put in things like people on a rooftop in Google image search. I have no idea who these people are. <laughs> but I just wanted to, um, you know, capture that feeling of people on a rooftop on a hot summer night just to that somehow just, that helped me enter the world of the drawing. And then I had all of my family photos. I had this, I stole my family's, all the albums. I had all these loose photographs and, that I organized in a, a box, and I would constantly be referring to those as I drew. Here's my dad. <laughs> Didn't your dad lay around like that? <laughs> I took this picture of him. Um, this was my dad around the time that this story, that this scene happened. Here's me at, when I was 15 at the same time with my cousins, my mom and my grandmother. I used that shirt that I'm wearing in this scene too. So I was constantly like marinating in all of these old images. And then came my really crazy part of the process, which is I posed for all of the figures in the, in the book. I do this for my comic strip too. It's just a quick, easy way to get a photo reference for a, a pose, you know, so I get the, so I make the character look right. So I would, I would act out all these things, even the little background characters. Or even just someone just standing there. Somehow I, I've gotten very dependent on having to have a camera. Or here I'm posing for, like, my dad coming out of that doorway onto the roof. So I take all of that information, and that helps me to do this very nice, tight, neat pencil sketch on my good paper. And at this point, about 95% of the work, I would say, is done. And then the fun part comes, which is um, inking it. I can just relax and ink it ink over those pencil lines and then erase them when I'm done. And you can see I've made some mistakes here, like that building's all screwed up and there's a little sploot down there. But then I scan all that into Photoshop and fix all the mistakes <laughs> digitally. And I can cheat also by filling in those black areas like with a mouse click. And then I did this shading technique with ink wash, with watered down ink on a separate piece of paper. I would put my line art on a light box so I could, and then put watercolor paper on top of it so I could see the drawing shining through. For, that's very complicated. I won't explain to you why I did that, but that's what I did. And um, shaded everything. Then I scanned this shading layer into the computer and put it together with the line art. And then I got this. And it wasn't until I'd done all that work that I could see really how this all looked together. I sort of was operating on faith. And even then I had to, there was a whole other stage of getting the, the lettering imported. So this is, the, I would send a file like this off to the publisher. And I still didn't know what the final actual book would look like until I had it in my hands like a month ago because on the publisher's end they, um, they, did the, they turned that gray layer green so the book looks like that. So that's one panel out of, there's like 900 to 1,000 panels in the book. <laughs> it's really crazy. And I, if you're thinking of writing a graphic novel, I would suggest that you stop right now. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to read a little bit more. And then we can do questions and answers if you like. Um, in that first chapter that I read you, I, I introduce my dad as a character. In the second chapter, I talk about... Um, Growing up, working in a funeral home, one of my dad's jobs was um, he was a funeral director in the family funeral home. In the third chapter, um, I talk about how it was when I came out to my family as a lesbian when I was in college, when I was 19, that I found out that my dad was gay. Um, so this chapter, chapter four, um, delves into my relationship with my father, especially um, focusing on our, our shared homosexuality. And also the book, my dad loved books. He was a great reader. And as I wrote the book, it start, I, his auth, favorite authors and books started creeping into it more and more. And I, and I found myself eventually organizing the book around these other books. Each chapter kind of has a a book or an author that it focuses on, and chapter four is the, the Proust chapter. Chapter four, In the Shadow of Young Girls in Flower. 
I have suggested that my father killed himself, but it's just as accurate to say that he died gardening. He'd been clearing brush from the yard of an old farmhouse he was planning to restore, and had just crossed Route 150 to toss an armload over the bank. The truck driver described my father as jumping backward into the road as if he saw a snake. And who knows? Perhaps he did. Of all his domestic inclinations, my father's decided bent for gardening was the most redolent to me of that other, more deeply disturbing bent. What kind of man but a sissy could possibly love flowers this ardently? Our home was an efflorescence of bulbs, buds, and blooms, flowers wild and cultivated, native and imported, flowering vines and trees, silk flowers, glass flowers, needlepoint flowers, flower paintings, and where any of these failed to materialize, floral patterns. At Easter, Dad would paint goose eggs with twining tea roses. During the ensuing hunt, we would be sure to find a yellow egg in a thatch of daffodils, a lavender egg passing itself off as a crocus, and nestled in the crab apple tree, a pink egg, the precise shade of the blossoms that would soon burst forth there. Our games of baseball, already lethargic affairs, would grind to a halt as soon as the ball rolled near a perennial border. <laughs> there my father would become lost to us in a reverie of weeding. At the fun home, the fun home is, is what we would call the funeral home where my dad worked. That was like our, you know, cavalier way of referring to it. Um, that's also the title of the book, obviously, Fun Home. At the Fun Home, Dad would take a break from his grisly chores to tweak the stiff arrangements delivered by the florist. Ugly as these were, their quick, damp scent masked the odor of formaldehyde. If my father had a favorite flower, it was the lilac, a tragic botanical specimen invariably beginning to fade even before reaching its peak. This panel is a passage of text from a book. I did, did that a lot in the book. We stopped for a moment by the fence. Lilac time was nearly over. Some of the trees still thrust aloft in tall purple chandeliers their tiny balls of blossom. But in many places among their foliage, where only a week before they had still been breaking in waves of fragrant foam, these were now spent and shriveled and discolored, a hollow scum, dry and scentless. That's how Proust describes the lilacs bordering Swan's Way in remembrance of things past. My father had begun reading this the year before he died. After the lilac passage, Proust describes Swan's garden in a feat of both literary and horticultural virtuosity that climaxes in the narrator's rapturous communion with the pink blossoms of the hawthorn hedge. <laughs> Through the hedge, Proust's narrator could see even deeper into Swan's garden. There, surrounded by jasmine, verbena, and pansies, sat a little girl. The young narrator, failing to distinguish this girl, Gilbert, from the general, general floral fecundity, instantly fell in love with her. If there was ever a bigger pansy than my father, it was Marcel Proust. <laughs> Proust would have intense emotional friendships with fashionable women. 
but it was young, often straight men with whom he fell in love. He would also fictionalize real people in his life by transposing their gender. The narrator's lover, Albertine, for example, is often read as a portrait of Proust's beloved chauffeur-slash-secretary, Alfred. My father could not afford a chauffeur-slash-secretary but he did spring for the occasional yard work assistant slash babysitter. He would cultivate these young men like orchids. I admired their masculine charms myself. Indeed, I had become a connoisseur of masculinity at an early age. <laughs> I sensed a chink in my family's armor, an undefended gap in the circle of our wagons, which cried out, it seemed to me, for some plain two-fisted sinew. I measured my father against the grimy deer hunters at the gas station uptown with their yellow work boots and shorn sheep haircuts. And where he fell short, I stepped in. I counted as an indication of my success the nickname bestowed on me by my older cousins. <laughs> no one needed to explain what it meant. It was self-descriptive, cropped, curt, percussive, practically onomatopoeic, at any rate, the opposite of sissy. And despite the tyrannical power with which he held sway, it was clear to me that my father was a big sissy. Proust refers to his explicitly homosexual characters as inverts. I've always been fond of this antiquated clinical term. It's imprecise and insufficient, defining the homosexual as a person whose gender expression is at odds with his or her sex but in the admittedly limited sample comprising my father and me, perhaps it is sufficient. Not only were we inverts, we were inversions of one another. While I was attempting to compensate for something unmanly in him, he was attempting to express something feminine through me. It was a war of cross-purposes and so doomed to perpetual escalation. Between us lay a slender, demilitarized zone, <laughs> our shared reverence for masculine beauty. But I wanted the muscles and tweed like my father wanted the velvet and pearls, subjectively, for myself. The objects of our desire were quite different. Shortly after Dad died, I was rooting through a box of family photos and came across one I had never seen. It's low contrast and out of focus, but the subject is clearly our yard work assistant slash babysitter, Rob. It appears to have been taken on a vacation when I was eight, a trip on which Rob accompanied my father, my brothers, and me to the Jersey Shore. I remember the hotel room. My brothers and I slept in one adjoining it. 
The blurriness of the photo gives it an ethereal, painterly quality. Rob is gilded with morning seaside light. His hair is an aureole. In fact, the picture is beautiful. But would I be assessing its aesthetic merits so calmly if it were of a 17-year-old girl? Why am I not properly outraged? Perhaps I identify too well with my father's illicit awe. A trace of this seems caught in the photo, just as a trace of Roy has been... Rob, sorry, I had to keep changing his name. Just as a trace of Rob has been caught on the light-sensitive paper. The picture was in an envelope labeled family in dad's handwriting, along with other shots from the same trip. The borders of all the photos are printed August 69, but on the one of Rob, dad has carefully blotted out the 69 and two small bullets on either side with a blue magic marker. It's a curiously ineffectual attempt at censorship. Why cross out the year and not the month? Why, for that matter, leave the photo in the envelope at all? In an act of prestidigitation typical of the way my father juggled his public appearance and private reality, the evidence is simultaneously hidden and revealed. And that's the end of my presentation. And uh, <laughs> Thank you. Let's turn up the lights. Thank you. Yeah, let's bring up the lights and see if people have anything they want to ask or say. Oh, we're, we're doing something with a microphone, right, Andy? Yeah. Um, so who's got that? You got that? All right, so this woman will bring you the mic if you have a question. Right here. Oh, you, you asked me questions all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Is it on? So I just want to say that it's um, even more beautiful when you read it. And it's so moving, and I, like, want the audio book. You know? <laughs> so just thank you so much for doing this. It's, it's, it's really, really fun to read it really to an audience. Um, it's very different, you know? It's, a whole, it's like it's a whole other medium almost, like a live comic strip or something. Okay. <laughs> There's somebody over on the other side there. I recognize a number of the people from Dykes to Watch Out For, and I was wondering if they were always your family who happened to be in Dykes to Watch Out For or the other way around. Uh, I think it's just sloppy drawing on my part. Um, I, some people, a lot of people say that uh, as a child I draw myself to look like Raffi, the little boy in my comic strip. Um, I hadn't, hadn't meant for that to happen. Um, really? Like what characters? <laughs> the... Well, Rafi, and then um, your father is, what's her face? What's her Most name? Most current girlfriend. Oh, no, no, her father Oh, my is... father does look kind of like Sidney's father. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sidney's father, yeah. that's what it is. I, I do, yeah. one of my, I have a character yeah. in my comic strip, Sidney, whose father is a professor. I, I actually sort of think of her dad as my dad. Like, if my dad had lived, I would love to, you know, have that kind of relationship with him. I imagine we would have that kind of somewhat difficult but somewhat wonderful relationship. Anybody else? Right here? here Got to use the I'm mic. I'm really loud. <laughs> uh, how has your family reacted? How has my family reacted? Everybody wants to know that. Um, well, my mom is not terribly happy that I've done this book. I mean, I've, I let them all know, let my mom and my brothers know that I was doing this um, early on, and I've sh shared drafts of it with them. And... My mom is a very private person. It's it's disturbing to her that, well, not only that I'm making this story public, but also that I kind of, I've kind of betrayed her in a way. Like a lot of the information I have about my dad, I got from my mother. It's stuff that she told me over the years, and um, she felt quite betrayed that I had gone and made this all public. But also, my mother is a, a remarkable and wonderful person, and she she's a a writer and she reads and she understands the creative process and there's a way that she like has respected this as something I needed to do and even though it's hard for her um, she's been really pretty great about it. My brothers are pretty cool about it too. They help me with little details of research. Yes. 
You said that you started this seven years ago. Did you, were you thinking about it before that? How did you come to get this? <laughs> Sorry, there, a, a good friend of mine is sitting behind you. I just realized. <laughs> oh. Uh, how did you come to how did you come to uh, start this or was it you um, know festering in your mind and also it was, this has been festering for like 25 years ever okay. since, since soon after my dad died I, it was something I, I felt like I needed to write about it um, something problem oh, no, okay no. Um, <laughs> but you know when I was 20 I I didn't have the perspective or the or the creative skills to even know where to begin with it, um, and I didn't. I never thought of it as a as a graphic story either at the at the beginning. And I also thought I couldn't tell this family secret, you know, in 1981 or whenever that was. I f it felt like I can't reveal this information. This is too personal. But so much has changed in those you know those 25 years um, or 20 years since I started work on it, and it just felt like. It wasn't such a terrible thing to say anymore, and in the meantime, I had become a cartoonist, and it seemed like, yeah, this would be a graphic story, and it just was, there was like this organic point at which I started working on it. In fact, it was, um, it was when my dad had been dead for as many years of my life as he'd been alive, when I was almost 40. So it was an interesting sort of halfway, sort of tipping point, when I suddenly had this enough perspective on it all to write about it. I had one more question about your writing. It, yes. Did you, you know, you showed how you did the panels, and I mean, and uh, did you actually write the whole thing out before you began, or did it sort of evolve chapter by chapter? Ha you have images in your mind. You said, "Oh, I've got to put that thing to that to words," or something like it that. It was more like that. It was it was a whole complicated mixture of writing, and drawing, and going back and changing everything. It began as just purely writing as text. But pretty early on, I wasn't able to say what I needed to say just using text. I had to um, start working with the images, and the images started driving the story in a way. But I don't know exactly how. It was sort of just like this thing that I had to submit to. I'm trying to go back and figure it out. Like, how did I do that? I'm not quite sure. Um, you? On, on the edge there? Wh whoever. Is that why you decided to become a cartoonist in order, I mean, you also obviously are a writer. You can put together a story. But I'm just interested in knowing how you decided to express yourself by being a cartoonist instead of a writer. Well, I'm not really a writer. I can't, I can't or express a myself um, the, the way I need to with just text. I need access to pictures too. I always feel like I want to say three things at once. You know, I sort of have like, not attention deficit disorder, but maybe attention surfeit disorder. <laughs> 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 and like, cartooning enables me to do that. You know, I have the track of the text, I have the track of the pictures. Together, they, there's a fusion between them that creates a third level of meaning, and there's all kinds of stuff you can do. You can have a lot going on and just convey an incredible amount of meaning in a very concise space. Uh, so I just feel like that was my medium, you know. That's what I've always done. As a kid, I drew all the time. I would write stories and illustrate them, and it's just kind of something I like to do. Yes, here. Um, I was at the comics panel at Book Expo last month, and um, you said then in response to a question about how it was to talk about this that you were, it was the beginning of the book tour then, the book had just come out. Um, so I'm wondering sort of a month later with all of this massive media coverage after years of you know, being in all of our lovely small presses, what it's sort of been like now publicly for a month to be talking about something that was so private for so long. It's very odd. You know, I. I, if I had really known what, that the book would, would get this kind of attention, I don't know if I could have written it. When I started it, um, you know, it was back in 1998, 99, and I was just envisioning 
Actually, I wasn't really picturing an audience at all. I wrote the book very much for myself. But if I thought about an audience, it was my dykes to watch out for audience, which felt like, you know, my friends, <laughs> a small group of people who I wouldn't mind knowing this intimate information about me. Um, but then we, the, the book got sold to Houghton Mifflin when I was well into it. At that point, I was like four or five years into the work. And so I couldn't, I couldn't go back. I just... There, you know, I had enough momentum going that I just kept doing it. Um, but it's very odd. Uh, it's a good thing, I guess. I think it's a good thing to have told the story. Um, but I don't know if I would have if I'd known this was going to happen. Yes, green shirt. Maybe as a as an add on to that, I'm wondering like how are you feeling about your two creative children, like the strip and the book, and like their relationship in your mind? That's an interesting question because now all of a sudden I have this other thing. I mean, for my whole career, like Dykes to watch out for has been my life, and I've been somewhat identified with it. Like it's just been everything, and now I have this whole other track, and I want to keep doing more autobiographical um, work like this. I'd love to do another full length book. Um, it's interesting about their relationship. You know, in a way, I feel like Dykes to watch out for, um, in some ways, like paved the way for this book about my dad, not just personally, but also like in the world. Like, I feel like Dykes to watch out for is part of this whole huge gay and lesbian movement that has been going on for 25 years and that has made it possible for us to like talk about our lives in, in an open way. So that's kind of cool. Um, and. Is that the kind of thing you wanted to know? Am I answering your question? Well, they definitely fought for time. I've tried to, I would have two weeks during the comic strip. I'd do two episodes at once, and then I'd have two weeks during the book. But if, as I got toward the end of the book, it took up like more like three weeks or three and a half weeks, and I would have these crazy binges of like trying to do, do the comic strip really, really fast. It got a little slipshod toward the end and lost track of some of my storylines. I apologize for that. Way, way in the back there? Hi, I had two questions. One of the strips that you showed talked about how um, when you hoped you'd grown up, you'd hoped that you'd live in a submarine, all metal <laughs> and kind of Spartan. Um, but in the picture of you kind of sitting in your kitchen, it does look like you have things there. Um, <laughs> so I'm There's kind of things. wondering if you've, what your home is like now, if you've inherited any of your father's decorating technique, if you yearn for a tack hammer or something. Um, and the other question is, I'm curious about what you listen to when you draw. Okay, um, first question. I know I don't actually live in a submarine. Um, but it's pretty, it's kind of spartan, my house. I have a lot of filing cabinets and, you know, the kitchen's just the kitchen that came with the house. I can't imagine, like redecorating anything. I would never do that. And I just let my house come down around my ears. Um, what do I listen to? When I'm, when I'm writing, I don't listen to anything. Uh, and when I'm drawing, I listen to... Actually, I listen to movies on TV. I can't watch them because I'm drawing, but I'll listen to them. Which means I have a pretty limited range. I can't listen to anything with subtitles or... <laughs> anything that's really good because you get have to look at it to get it. So I mostly listen to like, you know, middle brow movies. <laughs> um, right here in the front row. I have a couple of questions. The first is, you mentioned a diner in Philadelphia. Do you know the name of it? Do you remember no, which diner it was? I don't. I'm not even quite certain that that was Philadelphia. There's a scene in the book where I, I have this very hazy memory from when I was like, I must have been four or five, of coming with my dad on a... He had some work errand, and I imagined this happening in the hearse, <laughs> that he was going to pick up a body somewhere, which he had to do frequently. Um, and we went into a diner, and we saw this big... Bull Dyke, this big truck driving woman who was delivering packages to the diner. And I vividly remember seeing her because I'd never seen anyone who looked like that. Um, and my dad, I mean, I was five, and my dad said to me, Is that what you want to look like? <laughs> like somehow there was already this like 
thing that we understood, you know. Um, but I'm just guessing it was Philadelphia because that's the big, the biggest city where I can imagine there being such an out dyke. But you know, a lot. You know, I tried to be very honest in the book, but obviously I had to flesh some things out. I couldn't remember exactly all that stuff from being five years old. Okay. Um, over here. Hi, my question actually follows up on that more neatly than I ex expected. I was wondering to what extent there's sort of a division between author and narrator, because you know, you've been talking very directly, and I really admire that, about, about yourself in context of things happening in the book. Do you, do you, do you feel that, that the book is you, or would you draw a distinction there? No, I'm afraid the book is totally me, for b better or for worse. Um, sometimes I feel like my whole life is just like an art project, like I've just given myself over to this thing. It's not, it's not so healthy, you know? It's not, a, it's not so great if you talk to people I'm close to. <laughs> um, but no, I did not make a distinction between the author and the narrator. Yes, on the edge there. Thank you. Um, I loved I loved your drawings, and I want to just make a remark for, as an artist myself that I think you're an excellent drawer. Um, I you. wanted to just say that um, I wanted to know. I remember you years ago. I don't know. We were the same age, probably. Uh, looks like we are. Um, tw it was twenty some odd years ago, and I lived in les <laughs> Lesbianville. I lived in Northampton. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> And I was at a party with you. Huh. And um, in fact, I was at a number of parties with you, and you were not yet famous. And I remember you sitting in the windowsills or sitting in little corners and making drawings of people at the parties and saying you were going to be a comic. And I didn't know you at that point then, but I remember reading, looking over your shoulders and reading your cartoons. <laughs> And I just wanted to know a little bit about how um, how you made a decision to become a to really to make that your living, and how have your cartoons evolved and changed over the twenty years? Okay, that's really funny. God, <laughs> what else did I do at that party? <laughs> um, that was I lived in Northampton like from 1985 to 1986. When I, that's when I was really I started doing the comic strip when I was in 1983, but just for fun, just something I wanted to do, and I had, had it published in like the, my local feminist newspaper that I was on the collective of. Um, but gradually, I started sending it to other papers and getting paid money for it, and it started to look like maybe I could really do this as a job. I mean, when I was little, I wanted to be a cartoonist, but... Um, as I went through school and college, th that began to seem like really impossible, like nobody really gets to be a cartoonist, so I kind of abandoned it. And then I just became one, sort of by accident. And um, it was 1990 when I was able to quit my part-time job and just totally be a cartoonist. Um, you asked some other thing, but now I can't remember what it was. How has it changed? Oh, well, it's changed a lot. Um, so my drawing has gotten a lot better. If you look at some of the early strips, um, I've gotten a lot better technically. Uh, the word count has gone up once I compared like the, how many words were in a strip from like 1988 to a more recent one, and it like doubled. Um, I've always had political content in the strip, but I think it's gotten a little more. Um, a little more global in its concerns than it used to be. It used to be more focused on like specifically cultural or gay and lesbian issues, and now it's, I think, a little broader in its scope. Um, I don't know. I, it just always keeps sort of changing. I hope it keeps changing. Um, right here. Okay, one of my greatest fears is that as you take on these other projects, 
and your time becomes more valuable that you will spend less time on the strip. Is there any chance that you'll retire the strip? And no, how worried should no. I be? I'm so grateful to hear you say that. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear you say that because so, often people will, say, will ask me, are you going to keep doing the strip? And it sounds like they want me to stop. Like, <laughs> are you going to keep doing that comic strip? <laughs> Um, I, I really want to. I want to keep doing it till I keel over. Um. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 hard. I mean, I've the newspapers are folding and not doing well, and it's very hard to keep keep it sustainable. And also, I've had a lot of trouble with publishers and. Pardon me. Plant Planet Out dumped me. Yeah. <laughs> I got dumped by a bunch of papers recently. They're, they don't have, they have no money, you know. So I'm trying to do this whole thing of, I'm trying to, I'm putting a lot of effort into starting up, I mean, I have a website and you can read the strip on there. I'm trying to get, find a way to like make money on the web like, like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll get right on that. <laughs> okay, one or two more, and then we'll wind down. Over here, this woman has been wanting to ask for a while. Hello. I probably have a really bizarre question because I'm from a family of funeral directors, and wow. my brother, <laughs> once in a while for a little comic relief, will say, we put the fun in funerals. What, what I want to ask you is, did you feel that you were living a life that was somewhat bizarre? We did, because we lived what I called sort of a strange parallel life. There was the staged funeral life that was morose and mournful and pathetic. And there was our own family life that we had a balance with that. So somehow, all of this negativity was going on downstairs. And upstairs, we had to be quiet and not play the piano and not jump up and down and make sure we didn't cook certain foods because you could smell the odor of that. Oh, wow. So there was a strange sort of bizarre behavior that we lived. We, we knew how to be staged and stayed, but at, at other times we could be more fun, so to speak. Uh -huh. And I think also too, and this is another part of it, I wanna know if you experienced some of that bizarre living. And also too, did you find that growing up, you were kind of on the edge or on the periphery, that people thought you must be sort of strange? <laughs> So, yes. <laughs> that's what I wanted to ask. Okay. Um, the, the first thing you said about the staged life and the sad downstairs funeral home life, yeah, that totally went on, but I wasn't conscious of it the way you seem to have been. It was just like, I didn't really analyze it as a child. It was just how life was. Um, and, yeah, I did feel like we were kind of freakish. Um, I actually just got an email from somebody who I didn't know, but who was younger than me and grew up in my town, and he saw the book, and he said, um, my, my brother also is kind of <laughs> kind of freaky. <laughs> He's a heavy metal musician. And this guy who sent me the email said, we always had these rumors. There were these rumors about your family, <laughs> that <laughs> the funeral home family, that um, maybe your dad had killed himself, that the daughter was a lesbian and the son was off like in some crazy band. And it gave this guy hope. He said it gave me hope that I would like survive and like m get out of this small town. Um, but it was funny to me to find out that people actually did talk about us. You suspect that, but you'd never know it for sure. All right, one more question, one more person. I actually don't have so much a question as a thank you. That I just wanted to say that, you know, I've been reading your strip since, probably since you started it. And um, I'm sure I'm not alone in this room in saying that. And you have so lovingly and caringly and insightfully chronicled our lives and our changing world for so long. I just think we all owe you a very deep, uh, deep thank gratitude. You. And, and, at the same time, I'm so thrilled about this book, and I feel a kind of weird proprietary pride 
that, that one of our own has yeah. done this <laughs> and you. that you deserve every bit of success and, and acclaim that you're getting for this work because it's remarkable. Thank you. I think it's a really cool moment for all of us. I really do. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> thank you. I'm going to um, I'm going to go out and sit in the front and sign books if you want. Am I on? Yeah. Hello. Uh, she's going to go out and sign books. Um, the proceeds from the books are going to our Barbara Giddings collection, which is in the Independence Branch. It's one of the largest lesbian, gay, bi, trans collection, you know, anything but straight uh, in the country. Okay? So, come on up. Thank you for listening to a podcast from the Free Library's author event series. If you live in Philadelphia or are planning a visit and would like to attend an author event, information is available at freelibrary.org.